1985 was an incredible year for video games. A lot of important stuff was happening. This was actually a year before I was born, but I had brothers who grew up around this time and they were buying these new Nintendo things and it was awesome. It was a good time to be alive. So in my attempt to talk about the most important video games of all time, I think it's important to visit 1985. Let's talk about it. Let's go in the order of what was the most important video games at the time and maybe to the more obscure video games. Some games on this list will be incredibly obvious and some will not be as obvious. So what kind of games were happening in 1985? Let's see. Super Mario Brothers. Oh, that's an obvious one, right? Mario does, hey, a lot of stuff nowadays. Like, I mean, he stars in movies and he becomes an elephant and he blows bubbles, I guess. But once upon a time, he had about three powers. Run, jump, and, you know, weaponize gardening by fire flowers. But this is where the magic started, folks. And you know what? I know that. We all know that. I know that you know that we all know that. But it had to be said. You can talk about the best games of all time and not mention the GOAT, <laughs> the absolute greatest of all time. Super Mario Bros. has sold over 40 million copies, which was staggering for its time and is still incredibly respectable today. You know what's wild to think about? That's actually more than the population of Canada. This game practically defined childhoods in the 80s, back when kids believed their destiny was to rescue princesses by running sideways and jacking up some turtles and punching some bricks. But what do you say about a game that has had almost everything possible said about it? Well, anything you want, really. It's certainly not my favorite Super Mario Brothers game, and I'd wager that many people would agree with me, Mario fans or not, but this game had to walk so that Mario could, you know, run or dance or whatever other stuff Mario does nowadays. Competing in the Olympics? I, I don't know. You remember that first Goomba in World 1-1? It's probably the most murdered video game enemy in history. And ironically, he's probably the number one slayer of players ever. I am become death! Today we have the Consort of Verdun, but then it was Goomba. Oh, that iconic theme music? Koji Kondo composed it in just a few days. It's probably more recognizable than most national themes. Again, you know, sorry Canada. Not even a real country anyway. Super Mario Brothers may seem simple now, but back then it was revolutionary, and it's clearly one of the best games of all time. Duck Hunt. Duck Hunt, like some other games on this list, will still command your attention whenever you see it in public. Tell me, tell me you could resist a CRT plugged up with a zapper in front of it. Duck Hunt on the screen. You can't, it's like moths to a flame. It's such a simple game, but it's still so doggone fun. You shoot ducks, or pucks, or skeets, or whatever you, you call these things, clay pigeons. But the cool part is the zapper and the ducks. There's a noise that old school gamers probably remember fondly when you think about it. When you hold a zapper to a screen and pull the trigger, it would cause this weird reverb on the boob tubes and on the gun. It's, it's, it's really hard to explain that noise. It'd be like, I guess, if I were to flip this, like it's, it's kind of like that, it's weird but it's one you just you don't forget. And maybe this is where many of us started working around the rules for video games. I can't hit the ducks from a distance, but you know what I can do? Put the zapper right up to the screen and blast those bad boys right out of the sky. You can't really mention Duck Hunt without mentioning the dog, of course. When you're playing Duck Hunt, it can be really frustrating. So what doesn't help is that dog popping up to giggle at you. Shoot this mother! This mutt would later be immortalized in Super Smash Brothers, so, you know, I mean, that's cool. I'm not so sure who was asking for that, but it's a neat character nevertheless. Oh, and of course I have to mention the drama with the gun. Nintendo had some of these gray zappers, but apparently there were concerns about them looking like real guns, even so much that someone robbed a store with a gray zapper so Nintendo started making them orange. At least that's the story I've always heard. Correct me if I'm wrong here, maybe it's just like the legacy of the playground. I've, I've heard that story before. There are a few other games that you use the zapper for with the NES, but the one that probably comes to mind immediately is Duck Hunt. So where can you play Duck Hunt today? Well, on a boob tube with a zapper. It's not easy to get an authentic experience with Duck Hunt. Maybe we'll see it on Switch Control eventually, but not yet. Duck Hunt, it may not have been the first, but it definitely popularized shooting games for the home console. This brought guns into your home, which I know does not necessarily sound like a good thing, but it took the carnival stuff. It took all of these technologies that already existed and it made it convenient for people. 
And sometimes it's not about being the best. It's not about being the first, it's about convenience for people. Excitebyte. The most exciting part of Excitebyte is the abuse it allows you to take on physics and common sense. You control a motorcycle that handles like it's perpetually on ice, navigating ramps, mud pits, and jumps that send you to the moon. These courses seem to have been designed by someone with a vendetta. Who hurt you? One of the major contenders in this game is the overheat mechanic, which adds an extra layer of strategy to your racing. It honestly sort of takes the excitement right out of Excitebike. Unless the excitement is wondering whether or not your motorcycle is going to explode. That's exciting. Wow, that's much better. Everyone can enjoy that. One of the actually exciting features is the track editor. Wondering what happens when you combine an impossible jump with the mud pit? Well, F around and find out. Want to see what happens when you stack five ramps in a row with a pit of mud at the end? F around and find out. You know what happens. You already know, but you gotta do it anyway. God, is that what I've been doing to people? I belong here. This was mind-blowing for me back in the day. The fact that I could create a track and then play that track is wild, and it will be as chaotic and as fun as you can make it. You think it's funny to get kids to play The Lion King? No, it's funny to create a track and force your kids to finish it. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? No, I mean, it's still limited by that overheat mechanic, but it's a good time regardless. And the innovation of this game for the time in the simplicity of a home console makes it one of the best video games of all time. The Oregon Trail for the Apple II. Imagine the nads on those guys who do this in a wagon. Pioneers, Brian, we share their spirit, manifest destiny. If ever there was a video game that really started resource management, it was Oregon Trail. It's like planning a family road trip through hell. Welcome to hell. Oh! You're the leader of a wagon train choosing between careers that represent difficulty levels. Bankers have it easy, carpenters are middle ground, and farmers, well, I guess they just love a challenge. You get to shop for essentials like oxen and bullets and pants at Matt's General Store before embarking on a scenic 16-stop journey filled with river fording, hunting minigames, and basically trying not to die. This is survival horror at its best. Oregon Trail isn't bogged down by fancy graphics or even too many colors. It's not bogged down with backstory or lore. There's no compendium for it unless you count American history books. It's good old, unadulterated, sweat of your brow, salt of the earth willpower. The Oregon Trail puts you on the frontier trying to survive, literally the Oregon Trail, and all the possible problems that could happen along the way. You could die of dysentery, you could die of a broken arm, a gunshot wound, typhoid, exhaustion, among so many other things. You had to plan for this. If you didn't plan, well, you're not going to be the popular one of the family. What have you done, Derek? Nothing! And while it was an educational game and intended to be an educational game, it absolutely transcended the genre of educational games. People still fondly remember the Oregon Trail today. We've seen remakes of it. We've seen iOS and Android versions of it. You've likely heard of dying of dysentery or something like that on the Oregon Trail or seen the screenshots of the Oregon Trail without even knowing what it was. It has been incredibly pervasive in society, making it, of course, one of the best games ever. As for probably the most obscure one on this list, we have Ultima 4 Quest of the Avatar. Ultima 4 revolutionized morality in RPGs. You sick you can't just rob people and get away with it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his very soul? What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets! RPGs up until this time were made of a go kill the bad guy sort of quest. And Richard Gary at Lord British himself recognized this and wanted to make his games a little more complex. He decided to focus on moral choices and personal growth rather than just fighting enemies and collecting treasures. Don't get me wrong, I'm in it for the loot, man. I'm in it for the perps. But if I can readjust my moral compass while I'm at it, hey, shut up and take my money. While this is standard fare today in video games, this was incredibly different in 1985. Beyond being a cool concept, this game was a technical marvel. Imagine trying to fit this sort of moral complexity on a floppy disk. The idea in Quest for the Avatar is to become the Avatar, to become a person of great virtue. This game is based around following eight virtues. 
honesty, compassion, valor, justice, sacrifice, honor, spirituality, and humility. Each virtue is important, and you need to show these qualities in your actions throughout the game. The game starts with a series of questions that help you determine your character's strengths and weaknesses. These questions are based on the eight virtues and help shape your journey. Lord British saw the need for this since his earlier games rewarded players for stealing and murdering and such. That's the same idea here. You may get some temporary reprieve by robbing someone as you get their money and items, but if you do, it costs you your honesty, compassion, and justice. I mean, you wouldn't steal a car. This game is straight up a lesson in ethics and morality. I guess you just can't beat up hookers in this game. Sorry, GTA. Uh, Harold would never beat up his landlord. <laughs> Ultima 4 was super popular when it was released and is still remembered today as one of the best role-playing games ever made. It has clearly inspired many games and has thus earned its place among the best video games of 1985. So if you've ever dreamed of saving the world by being really nice, Ultima 4 is the game for you. Forget about killing evil overlords. Forget formidable bosses. This time, it's all about slaying your own moral shortcomings. And that, for someone like me, is the dark souls of self-improvement. What best game of 1985 did I miss? Let me know in the comments, and thank you so much for watching.